Okay, we're going to continue. So this will be the last sermon about Satan. Hopefully, uh, like I said, the last few sermons have been interesting to you. If you missed the last two, you can go uh, watch them on YouTube. They're posted online. So today we're going to be talking about another three areas. We're going to be talking about influence, satanic influence versus satanic possession, right? And we're going to talk as well about why God allows Satan to exist. And I don't know if you've really sort of settled this in your own mind. You know, a lot of people ask the question, well, if God knew about Satan, why did he even create him in the first place? So we're going to look at that question. And then lastly, we're going to look at what it means to be delivered unto Satan. If you've seen that phrase in the Bible, we're going to go to those passages and we're going to see what it means to be delivered unto Satan. So the first one we're going to talk about is influence versus possession. Influence versus possession. Now I've talked about in the last couple of sermons, a lot of people when they sin or when they're tempted, uh, they'll just callously say, oh the devil made me do this or Satan made me do this. And is Satan capable of that? Of course. I mean, he's capable of doing things to people and influencing them. Uh, he's even capable of, you know, possessing people. We'll look at some passages in the Bible. But when it comes to Christians, you know, I don't personally don't believe it's possible to be demon-possessed. But a lot of people will say things like, oh, Satan made me do that. Satan made me think this. Satan made me do this, do that. Now remember, Satan is not everywhere at once. He can't make you do things. He is a creature that was created by God, so he's not everywhere at once. Oftentimes, it is not Satan that is the reason why you sin. James 1 gives us the reason why we sin. James 1, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted, look at this, when he is drawn away of his own lust. And enticed. Then, when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. So, what's the reason the Bible gives us why we sin? Every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and is and enticed. And then, you, when you're tempted, when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. So, more often than not, people are sinning because of their own desire to sin, right? This is what the Bible is saying here. You're first tempted, you're drawn away of your own lusts, and then that's what entices you to sin. And then when sin is finished, it bringeth forth death. Okay, so Satan is not the reason you sin. It's your own lust, it's your own heart. But Satan can influence you. But I don't think it's possible to be possessed and also when we read in James 4 7 it's possible to resist the devil so you can see that as believers when it's saying here hey submit yourselves therefore to God resist the devil and he will flee from you that shows you that we have the power to overcome the devil right we can resist the devil and he will flee from us notice it's not that he will just leave you alone so there's some fear there that he will actually get away from you, right? He will flee away. We've got running in the other direction if you resist the devil. But how are you somebody that Satan may devour? Is if you don't resist, right? And how do you resist? Well, you need to submit yourself, therefore, to God. You resist the devil. These are like two sides, I believe, of the same coin. You resist the devil by submitting yourself to God, and he will flee from you. Now, why do most people believe, and I do as well, I believe it's not possible for a believer to be possessed by Satan. Right? We're not talking about being influenced by Satan. Unfortunately, too many Christians are influenced by Satan. But we're talking about demon possession, where, where a spirit actually enters into your body and controls you, uh, you know, and, and makes you do things that you don't want to do. When well, 1 John 4, look at this passage here, it says, Every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist where you have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, right? So these spirits that are in the world, the spirit of Antichrist, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So one thing you have to understand is, you know, the Bible talks about how what fellowship at the temple of God with idols. Now your body, when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, is now the temple of the Holy Ghost. 
right? So the temple of the Holy Ghost is not going to dwell with satanic spirits. And this is why I don't believe it's possible for a believer to be possessed by Satan. But can people be influenced by Satan? Can Satan's spirit influence us in terms of, you know, mess with our mind, influence us in the way we think, the way we believe, the way we behave? It can if we are not diligent about walking in the spirit right because satan can use our flesh to you know make us do the wrong things let's look at some passages where we look at satanic influence as opposed to satanic possession acts 26 to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of satan unto god that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance amongst them which are sanctified by faith that is in me so everyone that's an unbeliever to a certain extent has been influenced by Satan, right? Because they are not believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. They've bought into the lies, right? Satan is a liar, and the Bible says, and the father of it. So somebody that is believing on a lie is influenced by the satanic influence that is permeating our world. So whether they believe a false religion or whether they believe in work salvation or whether they have another Jesus, all these lies are in the world keeping people under the power of Satan rather than putting their faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. This is why the Bible talks about, you know, our faith is that over, was what overcomes the world. Because once we believe on Jesus Christ, we've overcome Satan's influence, we've overcome the world. So we see here, unsaved people are under the power of Satan because they believe not that Jesus is the Son of God. First Chronicles 21, And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. So this is not David being possessed by Satan. This is David somehow was provoked by Satan. We don't really, we're not really told how he was, was provoked. And I'm, I'm not even 100% sure why like, God got angry with him numbering Israel. A lot of people believe that you know, he, God wanted David to just trust that his kingdom was you know, growing, his powerful kingdom. But this idea of like, numbering it was sort of like you know, quantifying for himself because he didn't have enough faith that God was just going to, you know, multiply Israel. Uh, he wanted to know the exact number. So here we see Satan provoke David to number Israel and that actually got God very angry in that story. Matthew 16. Look at this. This is uh, Peter in the Bible. You know, after, just after the passage where a lot of Catholics believe he was like ordained the first pope, you know, because they believe he's the rock that the church is built on, as opposed to Jesus Christ and the gospel being the rock that the church is built on. This is later on in this chapter in Matthew 16, verse 21. It says here, From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chiefs, priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. So he's telling his disciples now, I've got to go to Jerusalem. They're going to kill me. But three days later, I'm going to rise again. So notice that he's already teaching his disciples, hey, these things that are going to happen to him. So it shouldn't have caught them by surprise. But this is why when they were shocked, they were hiding. You can see that they really were not believing what Jesus was telling them was going to happen. And here's a perfect example. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him. Can you imagine... Can you imagine rebuking the Lord Jesus Christ? I mean, Jesus telling you something and you telling you're wrong? I mean, this is like, this is what happens when you're influenced by Satan, right? And look at how Jesus responds to him. Oh, he says, rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord. This shall not be unto thee. Verse 23, But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. So like I said, I don't believe this is a satanic possession here. This is just Peter being influenced by Satan and telling Jesus, you know, not to go and die on the cross. You know, just kind of like Satan coming and tempting Jesus in the garden, trying to get him to sin, trying to get him to rebel against God and test him. Well, here he's rebuking Satan. But what, you know, this is, this is why. Why would you want the church built on somebody that can be so easily influenced by Satan. This is why we, are, we don't believe that the church is built upon Peter. Peter is not the first pope. And I don't know if you know this, but Peter was, mar Peter, Peter was married. Yeah. Right? So a lot of people, you know, the pope shouldn't be married and things like that. Peter was married. How do we know this? Because Jesus healed his mother-in-law. Right? So we know that Peter was married. And not only that, the same chapter that supposedly, uh, you know, the church was built on him, we also see him here, uh, Jesus rebuking him, 
and saying, Get thee behind me, Satan, thou art a defense unto me. Why? For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. So what is the satanic influence here? He cares more about the things of men rather than the things of God. Well, maybe he's thinking like he'd rather, you know, Jesus be here, you know, and say, preserve his life. He's not really thinking about what Jesus has come to accomplish and that he needs to give his life a ransom for many. Mark 4, look at this. We see some satanic influence here where Satan takes this word that was sown in their heart out of their hearts. Uh, now, how he does that, we don't really know. But, you know, something that somebody's been told, they've not retained because Satan somehow has got that removed from their hearts. These are they by the wayside where the, the word is sown. But when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. I wonder whether he does it by distraction, you know, whether he gives them other things to think about, keeps them busy and, you know, takes away the word. Or maybe he can just make them forget, you know, where, you know, they remember and for some reason they, they can forget. Uh, who knows? You know, we can only really uh, theorize there. Acts 5. Uh, Peter said, Ananias, look at this, why had Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep, keep back part of the price of the land. So this is the story where Ananias and Sapphira sold a fleet piece of land. They gave a part of that money to the church, but they told the church, we gave it all, right? They wanted to look good in front of the church and say, hey, we actually gave all of the money, but they kept back part of the price of the land. And Peter says to them, why has Satan filled your hearts. You see how Satan can influence people to savor the things of men, to want to look good in front of men rather than looking good in the eyes of God. 1 Corinthians 7, look at this, some more satanic influence. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time. What is this talking about? This is talking about a husband and a wife not lying together. He says, defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time. So the only reason why husband and wife should not lie together is because they have consent from one another. You know, if one couple is denying, one of the couples denying the other this physical intimacy, you can see here, this is something that Satan likes. He likes to be able to get into the family and be able to break up. And this is one way he does it, is there's no physical intimacy between husband and wife that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again. Look at this. That Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. It shows here that Satan is very interested in breaking up the family, right? Because when a family's not doing well, you know, he walketh about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Hey, one way he can get it is a couple, a married couple that is, has not got a good relationship together. They're not lying together. They're not, you know, loving one another. And he can come in there and make that wedge even further apart. And unfortunately, you know, that's what results in you know, divorce and adultery and all this sort of um, terrible things. You know, maybe just having a, you know, a poor environment at home as well. John 13. So here we see Judas Iscariot. First of all, we see him being influenced by Satan. John 13, supper being ended. The devil how, having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. So you see here, there, that was the, you know, the, the satanic influence in Judas' life that made him want to you know, betray the Lord Jesus. But then we see later, when he actually took of the sop. So remember John asked you know, you know uh, well, Peter asked John, right, saying, hey, ask him, who's going to betray? And then he says to, to John, you know, whoever I dip the sop and give it to, him it is. So even after he did that, can you believe that? Even after he dipped the sop and gave it to Judas, and then Judas goes out to go and betray him, they still think he's just going to go out and do something with the money, right? This is how, this is like, you've got to imagine this, that they, even when Jesus said it's going to be Judas, they still did not believe that it was Judas. You know, so oftentimes in uh, movies, you see Judas, you know, he's, he's the only disciple with black hair and he's always like a bit of sketchy looking. No, no, no. Like, uh, you know, people like Judas, they, they, they know how to act the part. You know what I mean? They, they know how to blend in. You know, it doesn't mean we're always looking out for the Judas. No, but you, know, you just need to know that. Sometimes there are 
people among you, and, and there was, uh, Jesus had them among him as well. Luke 22, 3. Look at this. So this is when he actually takes the stop. It says here, verse 3, Then entered Satan into Judas. Right, so here is actually Satan personally possessing another person. Right, and here he's actually possessing Judas. He entered into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve. And this is when he goes off to betray Jesus. So we have satanic influence, right? And unfortunately, too many Christians are influenced by Satan. You know, when you have wrong ideas, when you don't savor the things of God, but the things that be of man, when you're worldly, this is why the Bible talks about, you know, when you love the world, the love of the Father's not in you. But who's the prince of this world? So you can see how the influence of Satan in this world can get to you, right? And satanic influences can come not only in doctrine, not only in worldliness, but in philosophies as well. You know, the role of husband and wife, that's a satanic influence in society where you know they don't want the men to be leaders they don't want the women to be followers and you know people don't like that it just shows how effective satan is that he has even duped christians into doing it. christians thinking it's okay for the wife to lead the family christians to think it's okay to skip church christians to think you know abortion is okay you know things like that oh yeah it's, it's okay in some instances well you know abortion is murder you know so Satan has influenced a lot of things in this world and you know, this is why there's this spiritual battle that goes on and um, this is the battle that we're in. So there's satanic influence, but then you also have demon possession. So we have Judas who was personally possessed by Satan himself, but then we also see, you know, sure we'll look at a couple of examples of other people that were just demon possessed in the Bible and, and the difference between obviously being just influenced and being possessed by a demon. And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. Now, this isn't what you think it means, dumb. <laughs> that is just stupid. Right? A lot of people think their kids have a dumb spirit, but that's, that's just children just growing up being ignorant. This is talking about dumb meaning he's unable to speak. Right? Dumb spirit. And wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth and gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away, and I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. He answered him and saith, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. So you see that there's this boy that's possessed of a devil, and you can see that when somebody's demon-possessed, they lose control. Right? They don't always have control over themselves. Now the Holy Spirit does not work this way. Right? The Holy Spirit, the Bible says in Corinthians that the spirit of the prophets is subject to the prophets. You know, when you're filled with the Holy Ghost, you're walking in the spirit, you're in control, you're sober, you know what's going on. And that's why in the, in the Pentecostal movement, you know, in the Pentecostal charismatic churches, and they believe in this whole like slapping on the forehead, filling you with the Holy Ghost. And then, I don't know if you've been to these, uh, some people have been to these types of church services. If you haven't, what happens is they get this guy who's like slapping people on the forehead and you know, say, and then people fall down and literally blank out, lose control, giggling, convulsing on the ground, and they think that's them being filled with the Holy Ghost. I'm sorry, guys, like, this is not people being filled with the Holy Ghost. Either, either they're pretending, right? They might just be pretending just to fit in, but oftentimes I believe it's this. It's a demon possession where people are losing control, blanking out, and it's something demonic that is going on. Anyway, so here's Jesus. They, they tried... So the disciples tried to cast him out. They couldn't. They bring him to Jesus. He's saying, hey, faithless generation, bring him unto me, verse 20. And they brought him unto him. And when he saw him straightway, the spirit tear him. Look at this. And he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming. Man, doesn't that remind you of like the, the charismatic person on the ground, like falling on the ground out of control? And he asked his father, how long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, of a child. And oft times it had cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. You can see his father, he's, he's desperate for help. Jesus saith unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And uh, this, this passage always gets me, you know, this uh, verse 24. And straightway the father of the cry child out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou 
mine unbelief. Oh man, what words in the Bible where you know, this father is so desperate to help his child and he says here, he wants to believe, but at the same time he's struggling to believe. And look at what he says to Jesus. He says, Lord, I believe, but help thou mine unbelief. Help me with what I'm doubting. Help me with what I do not believe. When Jesus saw that, the people came running together he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him, and enter no more into him. The spirit cried and rent him sore and came out of him, and he was as one dead, insomuch that many said, He's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he was come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could not we cast him out? He's saying, Hey, how come we weren't able to do it? And he said unto them, This kind can come forth. By nothing but by prayer and fasting. So it looks like there are, you know, I don't know if it's all demonic spirits or maybe just this one in particular, where, you know, they were just able to cast out devils in Jesus' name, these, uh, these, uh, some of his disciples that Jesus had given this the power to. But Jesus saying, hey, this one doesn't just come out in Jesus' name, but you actually, it actually requires prayer and fasting. So oftentimes, prayer and fasting is a way we show God that we are sincere in what we're asking him and it can cause God to move in our favor if we are sincere about what we're praying. One more passage here about demon possession. And when he went forth to land, this is uh, Jesus he's coming over this, uh, this, uh, this lake, and he meets, uh, there's actually two people here, but in Luke 8, it only mentions one of them. It says, He met him out of the city, a certain man, which had devils long time, and wear no clothes, neither abode in any house, but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, look at this. So when this demon possessed, when these devils saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and with a loud voice said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God, most high? I beseech thee, torment me not. So isn't this interesting? Oftentimes people are fearful of demonic spirits you know rightly so right you know sometimes you walk now in a dark place like you know, watching too many horror movies and you, know, you got things in your mind but should we be scared of demonic spirits you know surely we don't want to mess with them but we don't need to fear them why because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world why you don't need to fear them and look here this demon possessed person when he saw jesus what was his response you know in other passages it says they fell down they worshiped him they recognize who Jesus is. They know Jesus is the Son of God. And look at this. I beseech thee, torment me not. So they know that their judgment is coming. Right? And another passage it says, Has you, have you come before the time? Right? So you remember this. Sometimes when you're a bit fearful about demonic spirits, know who the Lord of these demonic spirits is. They answer to Jesus Christ. They are fearful of him. They bow down. They worship him. Right? They are subject to him. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For oftentimes it had caught him and he was kept bound with chains and in fetters. And he broke the bands and was driven of the devil into the wilderness. So we see Jesus in the gospel healing. You know, this is a picture of the, the spiritual healing we get when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Obviously, there are these physical miracles that are happening here. And oftentimes, a lot of the spiritual, you know, exorcisms that are happening in the Bible is also a picture of how Jesus can free us from the bondage of sin, from the bondage of Satan, right? And Jesus asked him, saying, What is thy name? And he said, Legion, because many devils were entered into him. So, I'm not saying that there's no such thing as demonic influence. Obviously, there's, there's a such thing as demon possession. But you need to be aware there, there is such thing as angels and demons. You know, like this is not, these don't just live in the land of fantasy. You know, I've met people that have, you know, been in these situations where they describe people like shape shifting and levitating and all these cutting themselves and they don't bleed. And you ask, Victor, do you think this stuff is legit? Do you think this stuff is real? Yeah, I think there's real things out there. There's real supernatural things that go on out there. I just think uh, we don't see a lot of it in Australia. This is my, my theory, and this is what some people uh, used to talk about this about, think, well, because we live in a world where we are so distracted with technology and entertainment, and, we're, and um, if you think about you know, the Western world is already so not religious, why would Satan want to reveal himself? 
You know, like why, if, if most of the people here are atheists, don't care about the things of God, just chasing career and thinking about the things of the world, you know, being influenced by Satan already in that aspect, rather than in a religious aspect, well, why would Satan want to, all of a sudden, you know, you're hearing about this, this spirit appearing here, this spirit here. Here, in, in our world, you think about people doubt that that stuff is really real because they think, well, you know, is there really this afterlife? Is there really the de 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 demonic world and angelic world? So it's the opposite here. And this is why I think Satan is very smart in, in how he deceives people. And obviously he operates differently in different parts of the world. In a part of the world that may be more religious, may, more spiritual, you know, think about when we were in, when we were in Mexico, you know, and people that think they're Catholic, but then I don't know what religion they're following, but it's some lady Guada, Guada, Guadalupe, Guatemala or something. Gua, is it Guadalupe? Lady Guadalupe. And they're, they're supposedly all Catholic, so then they have this sort of pagan, this guy in like this mask and like scaring all the kids, and they're all like dressed up in tears. It's like this pagan tribal worship, but supposedly they're Catholic? What's going on? You see, in that sort, this is how you can see the satanic influence trying to get the, these religious people doing the wrong religion, you know, practicing the wrong sort of religion. So you have demonic influence, you have demonic possessions. Hopefully you learned some things there. All right, number eight. Why does God allow Satan to exist? I don't know if you've ever asked yourself this question. And if you know the answer to why God allows suffering in the world, it's, it's, it's very linked. And if you've been in our church, you've probably learned it from myself. But people will ask the question, you know, why does God allow somebody, something like Satan to exist to cause so much trouble? Because, I mean, Satan causes trouble, not only for believers, but for unbelievers too. Luke twenty-two thirty-one. So this is the verse where Simon gets his name. This is your verse, Simon. Luke twenty-two thirty-one. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you. Now notice this you here is plural. Right? So this is why it's very important in the King James Bible, why we have these and thous, because thee is singular, you is plural. This is a good passage that shows why it's important to have that distinction. Because is Jesus saying to, to Simon, Satan hath only desired to have Peter? No, he's saying Satan hath desired to have you, his disciples, right? The followers of God. Satan hath desired to have you. Kind of like how we read about Revelation 12, how Satan's coming after God's people. That he may sift you as wheat. He's trying to separate you up. You think about it, you sift wheat, he's trying to separate them up. But I have prayed for thee. So who's Jesus talking about when he's praying? He's praying, not just very, he's praying specifically for Simon Peter. I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Right? So it's not just Satan hath desired to have Peter. He's desired to have all the disciples. But Jesus specifically prayed for Simon Peter that when he believed, right, what was going on, he was converted. We see that in Acts, that he would rise up. He would lead his brethren. He would strengthen his brethren. So Satan causes us a lot of trouble, right? First Peter 5, we already read this one. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, right? So he causes a lot of problems for us. But why does he exist? Well, now we're going to go back to Jeremiah 25, where we started. It's the passage we read. And I don't know, as you were reading through, you may be wondering, hey, what part of this passage is Victor going to refer to? Well, this is why I chose this passage to read. I want to show you some interesting things here. So if you notice in Jeremiah 25, it's talking about the judgment of Israel. They basically turned against God, they're sinning, God's going to bring judgment on them. Behold, the physical nation of Israel in this instance, as well as prophesying about the coming judgment of the world, right? And, you know, Nebuchadrezzar here, and Nebuchadrezzar Nebuchadnezzar, same person, right? It's just in different passages, they just slightly spell his name differently. But it's the same person. I don't know if it has something to do with how it's, his name is said in the original language. You know, maybe it might have been a difference and they preserved that, that difference since it's not an English word. So Nebuchadrezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, same person. So Nebuchadnezzar here, representing the king of this one world government here, Babylon, right? It's the same with Satan one day being the king. And he's going to put his beast in charge you know, being uh, the world leader of this one world government, and that's going to come on judgment. Again, 
this is where there's this one world government Babylon, but also judging the wicked nations as well. But look here in verse 9. Behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, saith the Lord, and Nebuchadrezzar, the king of Babylon, and I don't know if you caught this when we read through it, look, my servant. My servant. So you wonder why, why does God allow Satan in this world? Well, because God has a purpose for, why, for what Satan does, right? It's not that God is God's idea for Satan to rebel and all that, but he knew Satan was going to rebel, and now he's going to use Satan to fulfill his will. So what is he using Nebuchadrezzar, the king of Babylon, who also is a picture of Satan, to do? Well, he's using it to judge a wicked nation. Right? Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant. So it was God that allowed Nebuchadnezzar to go in and judge Israel, right? This physical nation for the sins that they have committed against him. And will bring them against this land and against the inhabitants thereof and against all these nations round about and will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment and a hissing and perpetual desolations. Moreover, so. One thing I just want to mention here is you need to understand that when you read the Old Testament, there's pictures of the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. So when you read the Old Testament, things are not always clear what is being referred to. And this is why you don't always want to misunderstand the Old Testament by seeing how God is dealing with Israel here as a wicked, unbelieving nation and think this is how God deals with believers, right? Because there are times when his mercy endures forever for Israel. And there are other times where he's going to make them a perpetual desolation. So he's using the nation of Israel as pictures, I believe, of both these covenants. What happens when they break the covenant, but also the promise he has made to them in the new covenant. Verse 10, Moreover, I will take from them the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the sound of the millstones and the light of the candle. And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. So you see here the captivity, the judgment, all that on the wicked nation of Israel. But look at verse 12. And it shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished, look at this, that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity in the land of the Chaldeans, and will make it perpetual desolations. And I will bring upon that land all my words which I have pronounced against it, even all that is written in this book which Jeremiah hath prophesied against all the, nation, the nations. For many nations and great kings shall serve themselves of them also, and I will recompense them according to their deeds and according to the works of their own hands. So this passage has always stuck out to me because I remember when I was asking that question myself about why does God allow suffering in the world? And I was thinking of it more from an apologetic point of view. Like, how do I defend this question? How do I explain this to Christians? How do I explain this to unbelievers when they're kind of trying to debunk the Bible and they say, oh, God's loving, you know, he knows everything, why did he create Satan? Well, I believe this passage gives us one of the answers because I, I remember reading this and, and when I read Nebuchadrezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, I was like, like mind blown. Like, I was like, wow, so God actually has a purpose and he's using Satan to fulfill things. And we see here that he uses Satan to judge uh, an unrighteous nation. But then we also see in verse 12 that it shall come to pass that he is also going to punish the king of Babylon. So not only does he use Satan for his will, but then he's going to punish Satan in the future as well. We talked about that last week, right? The, the coming judgment of Satan. So not only can God use, so God can use Satan to test, to chastise, to punish, right? So he, he uses him, even though he didn't create him for this purpose. Because why did God create Satan to begin with? Remember, he created Satan to obey God, to serve God, to, to be that covering cherub, right? It was a very privileged position to be one on the, one on the other side of, of where God sat. But Satan rebelled. Satan wanted to be like God, and it, it caused him problems. Psalm 109 verse 6, Set thou a wicked man over him, look at this, and let Satan stand at his right hand. Romans 9 17, For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Oh, here is Romans 9. So Romans 9 is about Pharaoh. I wanted to show you some other examples where God has raised up wicked people for a reason. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, so Pharaoh being another picture of 
the king of a large empire. Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. So if you think of why God raised up Pharaoh, another reason why he raised up Satan, he was allowed Satan to become the prince of this world, because God's going to get a lot of glory when he destroys Satan and judges him, and people realize, hey, he is the true God, that somebody even as powerful as Satan does not stand a chance against God. Judges 3. So not only this, we can see that sometimes God will allow negative influences amongst his people to test them. So not only is he judging wicked nations, you know, not only is he raising Satan up for his own glory, but look here in Judges 3 when it talks about the nation of Israel and the nations that Israel was meant to cast out of the land but left them in them. Now these are the nations which the Lord left to prove Israel by them, even as many of Israel as had not known all the wars of Canaan, only that the generations of the children of Israel might know, to teach them war at the least, such as before, knew nothing thereof, namely five lords of the Philistines and all the Canaanites and the Sidonians and the Hivites that dwell in Mount Lebanon, from Mount Balhemon unto the entering in of Haman. And they were there, and they were to prove Israel by them, to know whether they would hearken unto the commandments of the Lord which he commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. And the children of Israel dwelt among the Canaanites, Hittites, and Amorites, and Perizzites, and Hivites, and Jebusites. And they took their daughters to be their wives, and gave their daughters to their sons, and served their gods. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and forgot the Lord their God, and served Balaam and the grove. So again, another reason why Satan allows these things Again, it's to test believers as well, whether or not they would keep his commandments or no. And uh, I just want to skip over Deuteronomy 8. This is another situation where God allows suffering in the lives of believers just to test their faithfulness to him, test whether they love him or not. I want to go to 2 Corinthians 12, because here is a good example where we see Paul being persecuted or tried from an influence of Satan. Look at what he says here. He says, Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. So what is he talking about? He's, he's saying here, lest he should be lifted up and proud because of all the knowledge that has been given him supernaturally. He says, There was given to me a thorn in the flesh. Some people believe... This is an illness, a physical illness. Some people believe it may be a person that is persecuting him. I sort of think that that may be the case, but I'm not 100% sure anymore. I mean, it's something that's bothering him, right? But we know the origin of this is coming from Satan, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. Right? So you think of anybody could ask God to have something removed from him, that it would be Paul the Apostle. Right? But Paul, he said, I asked three times. What was the reply of God? He said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then am I strong. So sometimes God will use Satan. He'll use the rebellious angels that are out there to weaken people, to maybe attack people, to either test their faithfulness, but also so that they might trust in God's grace and they may lean on God's grace and be able to say, as Paul did, my strength is made perfect in weakness. And of course, Job... He knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as God. So we went through Job's story in a previous sermon. But obviously Job is the perfect example where God allowed Satan to tempt and to test him, knowing that Job had some things to correct, but Job recognized in the middle here, he said, hey, God will try me and I'm going to come forth as gold. Okay, so we learned that Satan is a very terrible and very dangerous adversary. We understand now why God allows Satan to exist. God has a purpose 
for Satan. So the last thing you want to do is be delivered unto Satan. But unfortunately, if you don't know what this phrase means, we're going to go through it. Unfortunately, Christians not only get delivered unto Satan, but they deliver themselves unto Satan sometimes. Right? And you don't want to do this. So how do you prevent yourself from being delivered unto Satan? Well, let's look at what it means to be delivered unto Satan. Now, I won't read all of 1 Corinthians 5 for sake of time, but we can see here in 1 Corinthians 5 the situation is there's a fornicator in the church, right? And it says here, You're puffed up and have not rather mourned that he which has done this deed might be taken away from among you. So Paul is saying, look, you need to remove this sin from the church. Right? For I verily have absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord, look at this, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So that's one example of being delivered unto Satan. Let's look at another one, 1 Timothy 5. But the younger widows refuse. For when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry, having damnation because they have cast off their first faith. And with all they learn to be idle, wandering from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also and busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. Why? For some are already turned aside after Satan. And lastly, we'll see here in 1 Timothy 1, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. So when you look through those passages, you have a fornicator being kicked out of church, you have ladies getting away from church because, you know, they've, they've cast off their first faith, and then you hear you have some, what people would think are heretics, being kicked out of the church. They are being delivered unto Satan. So what does it mean to be delivered unto Satan? It means it's when you get out of church. And, if you, and it makes sense that if you think of Satan as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, who does the lion go after when they go hunting? Right? They go after those that stray from the flock. And this is why it's so important that people are in church. Because not only you know, are you learning, not only do you make friends, but also it keeps you from the influences of the world as well because you're amongst God people. You're rubbing shoulders with hopefully people that are, you know, going in the right direction. You know, you're, you're following my lead, all that sort of stuff. So it's very important that you are in church. Now, people might ask the question, you know, do I really need to go to church? You know, people have this mindset. They think of church like the Catholic church. This is like a box that you tick off. And it's just like I go through this religious ritual, I make myself feel a little more holy. They think that's what church is about. No, church is about being in God's house, being part of the flock here, and being protected also spiritually from the influences of the world. But people ask, you know, do I really need to go to church? They think, well, I can pray at home. I can learn the Bible. I can just put a sermon online. I don't need to be in church. Do I really need to go to church? Yes, you do need to go to church. Hebrews 10. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. So this is one reason why we get together, so that you can consider one another and exhort and provoke each other unto love and good works to do things for the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is so some people are like this where they forsake God's house and you may know some of them already 
but exhorting one another and so much more as ye see the day approaching. So do I really need to go to church? Yes, not only is it commanded, but you show me the person that's not in church or thinks they don't need church and I'll show you somebody that's backslidden, that's worldly, that's not thinking about the things of God, that's just like caught up in the thorns of the world and you know what? They're probably doing nothing if not very little for God. Right? So the people that deceive themselves into thinking, well, I don't need church, I don't need to be amongst God's people, I don't need to be hearing the preaching of God's word, they're the people that get away from the flock and unfortunately Satan can devour, like Satan can influence them and they will die. You know, Helena was telling me about a good analogy I've heard of the church as well. The church is sometimes like a fire, right? And if you're one coal in that fire, when you're in the fire, you burn a lot hotter and a lot brighter. But you take that one coal away from the fire, what? It goes out very quickly, doesn't it? And that's exactly what it's like with church. You think, oh yeah, you know, you know I don't really need to go, I don't really need to, I can learn all this out. Well, you try it and we'll see how what your spiritual trajectory is like. I'll, show, I'll tell you, it'll start just going towards the ground. So don't be deceived. Church is a critical part of your Christian life and it's dangerous to be away from the flock. And this is why the Bible uses this phrase when the people are kicked out of church. What are you delivered unto? Delivered unto Satan. So in conclusion, the spiritual realm is real. Right? So hopefully after this trilogy, you, you know now that you know a lot of this fantasy and all that sort of stuff that people just try and make myths and legends there is a truth out there that all this is based on you know and who knows you know is uh, you know all sorts of things could be could be real but you know you don't want to play with it angels and devils exist we don't need to fear satan but you shouldn't mess with it either we don't go looking for it but if it comes looking for us for whatever reason we don't need to be scared we, we have a hedge about us we have jesus christ and you don't want to perpetuate false teachings about Satan. So hopefully in this series you've learned a lot, you understand now more about Satan. Don't perpetuate false teachings about Satan. But most importantly, at the end of this sermon, what I want you to take away from this is stay close to God. Stay close to God's people so you can keep yourself from satanic influence. It's very important in your Christian life to be part of the flock here. Not only about learning and making friends, but it affects your spiritual life as well. It makes you more susceptible to being under satanic influence, right? Being attacked by Satan. So be in church, and we've got to make sure we encourage people as well. Provoke each other unto love and good works. All right, let's pray. All right, Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for teaching us so much about Satan. And uh, Lord, help us, Lord, to, to, to desire to be in your house, to desire to be amongst the people here, and help us, Lord, to provoke each other unto love and to good works. We thank you, Lord, uh, for salvation. We thank you that through the Lord Jesus Christ, we, we know we're saved and we don't need to fear what man can do unto us. We don't even need to fear uh, what Satan can do to us. But Lord, help us stay close to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.